So uh, thanks to Michelle for organizing this along with MJ and Vicky and for making this opportunity available to me. It's a privilege to speak to you guys today, sharing both my parks practice story and my academic journey on the same subject. My subtitle has been borrowed from John Forrester, who is a planning scholar who wrote about planners discourse and its impact on how the public perceives and understands issues and processes. He argues that every planning decision is contested, so we need to have a fair and transparent and open uh, dialogue about issues. This notion forms the basis of the discussion that follows today. So I am a, this is me, I am a, I have, I've had a 32 year um, professional planning practice experience, 29, in, 29 years in park service delivery, and I'm a registered uh, parks a registered professional planner and a member a full member of the Canadian Institute of Planners uh, Most of that time was spent with the city of Edmonton and some of it with Strathcona County My roles within the parks functions in both municipalities included budgeting community park planning land use planning natural area planning and policy development I was the project lead on the 2006 to 16 urban parks management plan and the Strathcona County open space and rec facility strategy that was approved in 2008. My undergraduate degree is from Brock University. My urban planning graduate degree is from the Queen's University School of Urban and uh, Regional Planning. And I returned to school in 2014 at, at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Kinesiology, Sport and Recreation that ultimately led me to prepare my dissertation on park planning from an in institutional perspective. And my advisor is shown on the screen there as well. So finally, my style is, is one of having fun and being in the parks business, it's actually in your job description. You're supposed to have fun in parks. So you may see me introduce some graphics that reflect my personality. Before we, before we begin, are you with me? Feel free to bounce that annoying staff person or partner out of your office for the next 60 minutes. Mute your phone. You can blame both on me if you need to. Today, I will talk about how land use planning and land use planning decision making and parks decision making are linked that hopefully will provide insight as to why people are passionate about their parks. This is not a how to do process discussion, but a how to think about process discussion. So this graphic, uh, I call it my bunny graphic, uh, is intended to locate my lens perspectives and my biases. Everybody has biases. They're only problematic if you don't reflect or interrogate those in your duties, and in my case, in my studies. On the left is my personal and professional life, my 29 years of park practice experience, my academic training, and my lived experiences, including visiting parks in Europe, North America, and Oceania. Yes, I am a park nerd. You know, you know you're a park nerd when you have trained your adult kids to take pictures of park furniture to share with you. That may have been me. On the right is the parameters of both my studies and my practice, legislation, plans, policies, and societal settings, how and why they've evolved, each evolved over time. My dissertation is an, is an amalgam of my practice and my research. My discussion today goes into some depth on the park and leisure side of processes because I assume you folks are pretty familiar with land use planning processes and decision making. This is the title of my study that was recently accept, well, that was accepted in November of 2019. Uh, my qualita it was a qualitative analysis where I analyzed documents like uh, area plans and um, um, 
municipal development plans, park master plans, those kinds of policies. Um, I conducted 27 face-to-face semi-structured interviews and did an extensive literature review. I analyzed this da data using institutional theory. So to briefly nerd out on you, and I'll try not to do this too much, institutional theory is a social theory that it considers that considers the processes by which structures including schemes rules norms and routines become established as authoritative authoritative guidelines for social behavior that sounds a lot like planning to me and did at the time um, so park discussions can be controversial they can be confusing. They can be time consuming. Park uh, developers meet with the city to create area plans uh, that include identification of parks and park systems. Groups meet with the city to create co uh, more competition sized fields, opportunities for new activities like pickleball, create public art in parks, create new river valley trails, uh, dog off leash areas. We meet, meet with groups, individuals, developers, and businesses that from time to time object to processes, construction standards, and development timelines. There is sometimes tension in the air. Or sometimes those discussions can become animated. We've all been here on parks and other files. The, the files can generate media attention, from print media, television media, it can generate angry phone calls from counselors, from the public, so, so, social media attention can be created or worse, from time to time legal action. So why are people so passionate about their parks? If so, how and why did this happen? So I, again, I'm going to do a little bit of nerding out on you here, but my initial return to school was to study place and place attachment. I wanted to, I wanted to develop the, de the definitive piece of research that would answer why parks and leisure are important. If I was successful, parkies like me would be free from file discussions that suggested less parkland is needed in new plan areas, or I could quickly rebuff the gaze and discussions with politicians and corporate land managers who had bedroom eyes over land park parkland availability for potentially non-park purposes. I came to the conclusion the problem was not, it was in fact poorly understood leisure processes and how leisure spaces are created, not a lack of leisure research data. This was then where I could focus my studies. So I began to explore how social actors were engaged in park processes that identified, acquired, constructed, programmed, animated, and maintained parklands in Edmonton. As I mentioned earlier, I used, to, I used institutional theory to interrogate how parks decision-making occurred. I used two particular forms, a social relational institutional perspective uh, that was that I got from uh, a Belgian researcher called Peter Vandenberg, and secondly, historical institutionalism that I got from Andre Sorensen. Andre is with the University of Toronto. He was also on my dissertation committee. This graphic shares common elements of both. The large circle represents societal societal decision making as a whole as in our norms and values in society that are contested and ultimately drive decision making. So think back to a time in the late 1800s, now I, I know that's none of you folks, but in our planning history there was in fact no planning profession. Uh, housing was being built and it was poor quality housing, there was poor sanitation, disease spreading, and actually the Canadian Manufacturers Association said government, and at that point it was the federal government, we need to come together and figure out a way to create better cities. And the planning and the planning discipline, the planning uh, profession was in effect uh, born in Canada, kind of a 
creation story, you might say. And the same same way of thinking when parks, about the same time actually, when parks um, were first created in, in municipalities, they were largely ornamental garden parks where the affluent could go and, and rest and relax. They re weren't really for the working poor or the, the middle class or the working poor. Since that time, of course, things have changed. Societal norms and values said we need to do, th do park planning differently and we need to do land development differently. So the large circle, as I said, re represents that decision-making as a whole. Inside are the smaller circles that represent the notion that there are multiple needs and pressures to address in a pluralistic society. And some clearly are more powerful than others. Spatial planning systems are simply one institution embedded in a field of institutions, subject to change based on societal values and needs. When hegemonic pro projects like occur, like land development, they tend to exclude, marginalize, or suppress some groups over others to create what some call an illusionary community consensus. This, however, is not dire or catastrophic. It also opens space for opposing forces to engage in acts of resistance and make demand for reform. Over time, the collective dialogical positions between the hegemonic and non-hegemonic actors and positions are contested, and each set of actors influence the other over time. As the graphic suggests, institutional change is not guided by technical rationality that considers institutions like governments as means leading to a certain end, but by a social rationality based on societal interpretation and values. Simply put, the spatial planning system exists and has specific actors, roles, and processes, and there's a park institution that creates places from the spaces created in the spatial planning system, again with their own actors, roles, and processes, and while each institution is influencing the other. The spatial planning institution acts as a hegemonic entity, and the park institution as a non-hegemonic entity, largely because that's the way the legislation today is written. Both my dissertation, sorry, both of these institutions are influenced by the other, so there could be other institutions as well, such as housing, climate change, indigenous peoples, reconciliation, etc. My dissertation that built on my practice isolates how the land use planning institution and the parks institution in face, interface in decision making with one another over time in 1960 to 210 in Edmonton. So I looked at how social, political, economic, and governance areas in the, com in the community and country writ large influence the develop development activity and parks specifically in three temporal eras that coincided with the development of park systems in Edmonton and Blue Quill specifically. Blue Quill is my case study site. And that was from 1960 to, to 210. So from 1960 to 1980, plan and space creation parts of our processes occurred uh, and place, sorry, yeah, and place creation occurred from 1980 onwards. You will note that I'm using the term kinetic energy to describe the tactical steps required for something to occur. Without action, physical action, change does not occur. I mean this in a very literal way. An area plan does not get created by landowners without doing research, going to banks, uh, talking to consultants, crafting uh, applications, etc. So first I will describe how plan creation occurred between the parks and land use planning institutions. So the technical rational processes are shown above and the and the social actors are shown below. So landowners took have taken concrete action in this case in uh, Cascatail uh, area to create an area plan. This interaction of course occurs in meetings, in public hearings, 
Landowners and developers and consultants meet regularly with elected officials and administrators who are populated by, with, by people with professional degrees and specialized expertise. These group of actors are familiar with legislation, policies, and practices, and are used to speaking in public and private settings. There are a relatively small number of companies, a small number of expertises, a small number of elected officials and administrators who are essentially on a first name basis. Terminology and jargon are not a problem for most of these actors. The general public is largely sidelined until a public meeting and public hearing to gather their input. Um, but their input was uh, in any particular system wide, writ large, you might say, was captured previously at a high level plan in, that included the municipal development plan. At that time, the MDPs were called general plans in Edmonton, and in Park's case, a park master plan. So clearly this is a group you would be most familiar with. What I described is not denigrate, is not intended to cast any dispersions on these folks and their expertise and how they work. This is just the, the nature of the system. So I created this graphic to show how the land use core planning technical processes on the left and the parks institution technical processes on the right. So that, uh, and in this graphic shows the land use planning core technical processes are operational in the plan creation phase, which is only part A of this uh, graphic on the left. The park institution, however, operates in the background in park sites across the city, but is not operational until park sites are created in the next phase. However, however, the latter should and does influence from an operational perspective how a park system is created as per a park master plan. In the Blue Quill case, the plan was created and approved in 1971 based on the 1970 to 1980 parks master plan and the city's general plan. Simply put, you don't acquire a park, you don't acquire parkland in a park system with understanding how it will be operationalized, but it's not, the operationalization of it is not active in this phase. In this, so this of course is, sorry, this of course is what the physical product looks like. It's a written document. It includes plan, park network, in terms of policy, approximate physical location and sizes, it has transportation networks. It has uh, how utility uh, planning is gonna work. So it should be noted here that the parks represented in an area plan collectively represents a park system for the Cascateo out outline plan that is intended to build on and augment the existing park system across the city. These are both conscious efforts on behalf of park planners. I want to describe from a leisure perspective what's involved in creating a park and park system in an area plan. At the highest levels are programs shown in broad strokes, structured, unstructured, active passes, active and passive, all ages, cultures, genders, four seasons, etc. This broad program is further refined by activity, so soccer, baseball, football, diving, swimming, etc. You can at, you should also note that you can have uh, structured and unstructured aspects of each of these uh, activities. So, for example, you can have uh, unstructured hockey on outdoor community rinks run by community leagues, or you can participate in minor hockey programs, uh, house league, or, um, you know, traveling teams. Uh, so we, probably the same kids are playing both structured and unstructured, uh, um, are, are fulfilling program, structured and unstructured activities, programs. So to locate them with a park system, with, within a park system and site occurs in the top, topology and park design principles. So I'm gonna talk about our parkland classification next, but I'll leave that for a moment. But it is important to note that parks in Edmonton are considered to be multi-use. 
So sports fields can be skied on in winter. They can also, the green landscaping of all types, including sports fields, provide ecological goods and services year round. In the summer, dog off leash areas can be converted to out, outdoor skate. Blah, let me try that again. In the summer, dog off leash areas can occur inside outdoor skating rinks. Casual relaxation and reading can occur at playground sites. Dogs can walk on leash on all parks and off leash in only some other ones. Uh, grassy areas provide separation space between activities, provide ecological goods and services, and act as unstructured program places for sun tanning, reading, etc. So while we look at amenities as single use or activities, it is much more nuanced that, than that in practice. This, this is an example of a parkland classification system in the City of Edmonton Urban Parks Management Plan. For each type of park, there are specific uses permitted and not permitted in terms of program and activity. There are population guidelines. So a neighborhood serves four to thousand, four to six thousand people, district 40 to 60. Uh, there are city level parks, which obviously serve the whole city, sometimes called regional parks. There are natural areas that are resource based that can occur any, anywhere and greenways between and within neighborhoods, districts, and river valley, again, can occur anywhere. So there are various versions of these unique to each municipality. So now we have the plan created. Once, in it, once, once that happens, it can then be implemented. The plan can be turned into space defined by property lines. This, of course, is based on the kinetic energy of landowners and developers. Once again, returning to this, to this graphic, the space creation phase implements the area plan through, in steps B through H, so from subdivision to construction. Once again, the operational phase is the land use planning institution and in the background operates the park institution. In both the plan and space creation phase in Edmonton and in Blue Quill, it was an area of direct intervention of government in land use planning. Governments were more directive than practice today and not afraid to address perceived social issues. The 1970 to 1980 Parks Master Plan described itself as a social plan. Asked for top of bank areas to be reserved as public lands and suggested parkland reductions in a, in a neighborhood in the future can be offsite, offset by new parkland purchases elsewhere. It also was a plan that suggested that we could use transportation dedication as part of our parkland uh, dedication. So in fact, where we have 10% in that at that time, um, we still have 10%, we could actually use transporta transportation dedication as part as parkland. So this plan influenced how parks were taken and it was based on the kind of the social norms of the day. This is the land use planning institution in the space creation phase. So you have in, uh, area plans, plans of subdivision, zoning, engineering draw, drawings, servicing agreements, social actors of the landowners, developers, consultants, administrative staff, etc. This interaction occurs in meetings, council chambers, public hearings, and is, in, is very similar in many ways to the plan creation phase. Once again, the public has less visibility and action in this phase as developers are implementing a previously approved area plan with the possible exception of zoning and subdivision. This is a graphic that shows the various activities involved in creating an urban landscape, creating road construction, utility installations, housing. So now we've got a plan created, we've got the space created defined by property lines. So in the place creation phase, a space becomes a place when the space becomes imbued with social meaning. So I'm going to share with you how we go from space to place. Place creation, however, is created kinetically by the community. They develop, program, and animate spaces with the city. This 
return to my, to my trusty graphic here of the two institutions. So when the community helps fund playground, commute playgrounds, community halls, commu they plug community rinks, hold festivals, host minor sports, etc. That all occurs in the park institution. In this phase, so in this phase, the operational phase is the park institution. In in the blue quilt case, this began began in 1980 period and beyond. However, the 1980s also represented a dramatic change in how society in in, in governance, city wide, uh, society wise, the economy in the early 80s took a downturn. An approach to governance began to change. Increasingly over time, business interests aligned with government and vice versa. This has had a dramatic, I would also add that this was pumped, amped up even more during the Ralph Klein era. This has had a dramatic effect on the parks institution as government sought to reduce expenditures to reduce taxes. This meant that they began to rely more and more than ever before on community fundraising to fund park amenities much sooner and cheaper than funding it themselves. The community was pushing for this as well, so it was kind of a happy accident. The community wanted to do it because uh, the city wasn't building their park amenities fast enough, but it came with a cost or a consideration. We created, the city created programs like Partners in Parks and the Neighborhood Park Development and others in Steps B to H. That meant the community had an expanded role in creating places and most importantly, acquired a sense of relational ownership, which the city was actively promoting. The loons were now settled in their nests. So this is the park institution involved in design, construction, programming, animation, and maintenance. And the social actors were park administration folks, umbrella NGOs, community residents, park users, granting organizations. And in re recent years, actually, the development industry has begun to, to fund some uh, parks in, uh, in, in new areas, um, uh, but they're not required by legislation to do so. So that this institution is evolving. So ironically, you will note that there that you are likely reflected in this parks institution in your role as a community volunteer. You need the you need people, non-paid people, to coach teams, act as team managers, timekeepers, organize parties, tournaments and festivals, wash jerseys, sew costumes, uh, provide transportation, plant trees, flood outdoor rinks, help kids put on skates sit on committees, field calls for hall rentals, and fix boo-boos. I'm sure you've done fundraising as well, held, held raffles, you've sold cookie dough. How many, uh, how much Mondaire sausage have you sold? How You've held silent auction, bake sales, book sales. You've created costumes. You've knocked on doors for money for community improvements. You've applied for grants. You've filled out government pay, paperwork, and you've probably you may have helped install playground equipment. Once again, the connecting thread with the other two is kinetic energy to make the parks and the park system functional and enjoyable. You need to get people off their couch to make it happen. Unlike any other form of municipal infrastructure, there isn't a, you know, adopt a catch basin program or a adopt a pothole program. There isn't fundraising for transit. There isn't, fund, there isn't fundraising for Anthony Hende improvements, crosswalk signals. Those are all funded through taxes. But you, but you are likely to have volunteered your time or financial resources to build and operate leisure amenities. So in summary, kinetic energy plus financial investments supported by policy has come to equal a shared sense of community ownership of parks. And once again, as I said, the loons are in the net. So when we look at how parkland institutions have been further subdivided, we can see, in fact, multiple institutions that have grown over time as people move into the neighborhood and relationships, relationships between people and their places mature and grow. NGOs formed to advocate for their institutional needs. 
We have an in-district soccer association. We have an in-minor hockey association, both of which were originally started in the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues. The organizations develop institutional memory that can be referenced or brought to, or brought to be considered on any particular site, and these all revolve around on parkland, but not exclusively on parkland. Finally, to suggest so, so in addition to at the the sorry, I'm slightly out of work. In the blue quail case study. Processes I analyzed, in the processes I analyzed, land was the connecting tissue between the two institutions. They intersected, and I'm talking about the land use and the parks institution. They intersected, intersected well in the first two when the plan and space was created for the community, but not so well in the third. The loons took flight and they circled for 10 plus years due to changes in market conditions, strong community opposition, including an 18 hour public hearing that paid lip service to the historical and integral role of community in park operalizations. So in animating parks, in other words. So while all that was happening, leisure needs were growing and changing. Some sports like soccer had grown dramatically. Hockey was once an outdoor sport with higher level, high, higher level game com and competitions occurring indoors and, and regular games outdoors. This was followed by an era in the, in the 1970s where, we, where the city began renovating outdoor rinks with the communities into what they called shell arenas that ultimately were renovated to become single indoor standalone ice sheets. Today we build twin, twin ice complexes on district parks as part of multi-purpose rec centers. Indoor soccer, wave pools and fitness centers were not part of the park service delivery when I began with parks in 1985 and now are combined with twin ice complexes which can also include programming space for the community. School delivery is more diverse accommodating programs of choice, and their buildings have expanding footprints. Natural area retention using parkland was something that occurred sporadically, but in 2006, it was locked into policy in the Urban Parks Management Plan. Community gardens, as both a recreational activity and as a support for food security, is today a growing activity uh, is a growing activity demanding space. Over time, from plan approval to the 2000s, grew, needs grew yet, and I'm talking about in Cascateo and Blue Quill, yet no further parkland was planned or added. In the preparation of UPMP, we estimated to meet today's standards and needs, we would need 11.5% of the gross developable area, not the 10% available to us but we made a political decision to stick with the 10. So as spaces planned in 1971 develop and mature, the population develops and matures, and park sites must be renovated to accommodate new needs, even though no new land is ma being made available. This is occurring in the parks institution, which then should inform the plan and space creation phases as well. So I want to give you some um, key findings that, uh, so I want, to, I want to give you some big picture stuff and then I'm going to talk about some specific process issues. So big picture, you need to understand the past to plan for the future. There was a time when communities with poor housing and sanitation resulted in the creation of the planning profession, which I mentioned earlier. There was a time when we had grid street patterns, when residential, commercial, and industrial were all located, uh, a land use pattern we are now returning to. There were times when parks were the purview of the affluent. Like I said before, they, 
Stanley Park uh, was is an example when it was created basically to serve uh, the, the rich and affluent. Uh, over time, the program and activities expanded to include the working classes, classes and their leisure interests. This was contested at the time in Vancouver. Over time, working class folks joined with municipalities to kinetically and financially co-produce parks. There was a time when, as I said, when hockey was played mostly outdoors and now it's all indoors and it's on twin ice sheets combined with pools, which at one time were wave, were just tanks and not wave pools or diving tanks. And fitness centers did not exist 20, uh, 30 years ago for the most part. There was a time when our populations were indigenous people and mostly white European settlers. And we send indigenous children to residential schools. There was a time when there was a public school in almost every neighborhood and children walked, walked to school. All of the above suggest society values and norms have evolved over time and, and it, they became different policy. So pol different policy choices were created over time that, in, that basically drove the uh, land use planning and the parks institution institution. Good planning process takes time. There are more actors than ever for parks and that's a good thing. Oops, sorry. So as I said, I, I wasn't going to tell you how to do an individual planning process, but I want but uh, looking forward to future contestations, I ask administrators to ask yourself the questions noted on this screen in developing new planning engagement process, particularly on parklands. I would argue, however, that you need to ask yourself these questions simultaneously, considering the impact of each on the other. For example, interpreting, prioritizing policy, developing public messaging, with technical free jargon and power are all interrelated. So don't just tick off the box, tick off the box individually, think about them as a whole. So final thoughts, at the end of the day, parks are great places. They make, they've made, made great in significant part by the kinetic and financial contribution of the community at substantially reduced cost to the city and in timelines that were much quicker than otherwise possible. Land use and park institutions exist, impact one another based on societal values and norms of the day. The park institution created parks both as unique. The park institution effectively has created parks both as a unique form of municipal infrastructure and has generated a sense of perceived relational ownership of those sites by local residents other site users and the representative NGOs who are stores of knowledge and history. So in homage to our current COVID crisis and my American friends and relatives, I developed this graphic. I originally borrowed a black Sharpie to draw this, but I took the liberty to reproduce it for you, but I digress. So returning to the writings of John Forrester referenced in my first slide, Spatial planning decisions are by, the, by their nature contested and differential impacts will always occur. This is not a value judgment, it's simple reality. My study suggests that this, and this graphic elucidates the potential impact of mediating community park complex conflicts through synchronization of both institutions, parks and land use, each respecting the other albeit one, the land use institution has more power than the other. Having said that, I qualify that the potential depicted with this, with this graph assumes potential community reactions based on fair, respectful, timely public and timely public processes and accurate public messaging. That's about it for me, but I, I have a couple slides here of references. So if you want to uh, see in more detail what some of this work is about, I show them to you here. Thanks again. I am available for any, any and all questions. Thanks, Mary.